I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Jeffrey Gillis Davis. Dr. Davis is a research professor of physics with the Department of Physics at Washington University in St. Louis and the McDonnell Center for the Space Sciences. He is also the principal investigator for the Interdisciplinary Consortium for Evaluating Volatile Origins, ICE-50, with NASA's Virtual Institute for Solar System Exploration Research. Dr. Davis earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and his PhD from Rice University, where he was an LPI NASA graduate fellow. Before joining Washington University as a postdoctoral research associate in 1998, he was a postdoctoral research scientist with the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Dr. Gillis Davis combines experiments, remote sensing, and sample analysis to study the geology of the moon, Mercury, and asteroids. He has mapped the composition and morphology of the moon and Mercury as a science team member of three NASA missions, Clementine, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Miniature Radio Frequency Team, and MESSENGER. He uses lasers to replicate the impact of dust-sized particles on the surfaces of these airless bodies to examine a process known as space weathering. And we are very pleased to have him here with us tonight to talk about mysteries of the moon, what we still don't know, and what we'll achieve with Artemis. So won't you please join me with some virtual applause in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Gillis Davis. Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Rose. Let's see. All right. I'm sharing my screen now. How's that look? Good. Excellent. OK. So uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up tonight and giving me your, your Thursday evening. Um, and before I go on to talk more about the moon, what I want to do is actually take a brief slide to talk about science. Um, I know there's going to be some high school and even junior high and, and undergraduates um, possibly here tonight. And um, I think through most of my undergraduate career, I still didn't really know what science was about. Um, and it wasn't until I started doing science that I, I understood it better. So I wanted to throw this slide in just to kind of go over, you know, what what we do and why we do it. You know, we've, um, it always is said that science seeks the truth about the natural world. And we do that through, you know, that scientific method. Um, and what we're trying to do is, you know, understand the world around us and how it works and, you know, potentially be able to manipulate it, but to give us deeper understanding. And that deeper understanding um, replaces some of the the sorcery or maybe, you know, religious explanations from some of these weird abnormal effects. Um, you know, did you do something bad? Oh, you caused that earthquake to happen. But what we really understand is, oh, that's plate, tect plate tectonics happening. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a way of viewing the world and, and, and understanding it. And we do that through uh, consensus and evidence base. So the consensus part is, you know, as scientists, we write papers and we either, you know, agree and look for ever evidence uh, in our own data or modeling or observations to support or refute those um, ideas or hypotheses. And that builds consensus if you can't falsify it or prove it wrong, as we all have learned taking science classes and uh, looking at scientific method, we can't prove anything correct, we can only falsify things. Um, and in doing that, we're always under constant revision. Sometimes an idea does have uh, evidence behind it from a couple different areas. And then all of a sudden, you know, from an experiment or from an observation, that idea tumbles away and, and it's out of favor. And in talks like this, it always from start to ending looks clean and nice and pretty, you know, much like Martha Stewart's version of a BLT, but it's not like that in real life. It's, it's pretty messy, more like a Crown Candies version of a BLT. Uh, there's a lot going on there. You know, sometimes you make progress, sometimes uh, you have to go back a couple steps and sometimes you get led down uh, blind hallways and dead ends. Um, but it's that sense of exploration uh, is why we, we do science and uh, what really, you know, I like about doing science. It's that thing that you might uncover that aha or eureka moment where you've seen something for the first time, perhaps that no one else has seen that makes uh, science special to me. 
So just now on to the moon to give a little uh, primer about it, because um, although we see it up in the evening and morning sky most nights, um, we might not know all the, so all the terms. And I just wanted to review a few terms and where they came from. So Galileo is, gave us the terms uh, Terra for the brighter highlands area of the moon and uh, Maria called the seas. And he was or is credited to be the first person to really look at the moon under a, a telescope. And he noticed that the highlands uh, were very rugged and topographically high. So it made him think about you know, the, the mountains, the Alps um, in and around Italy and the, the Maria are very smooth and they look like they had flowed around different highland uh, prominences and they were topographically low, they had fewer craters. Um, and it just reminded him that you know, it, it flowed kind of like water. Um, but he knew it was not water um, because water and fluids have a special property that when light shines them at a certain angle, it reflects like a mirror. Uh, we call that sun glint. And that image there is from the International Space Station of the Great Lakes. And you can see um, Lake Ontario in the foreground. The sun's really you know, blindingly bright shining off that. And, and that doesn't happen, of course, with the, the dark Mario of the moon. So you know, the names, he didn't really think it was an ocean. And then you have these bright crater rays um, down in the lower left. So this is a very young crater, um, the crater called Tycho. And you can see its rays, the material that was thrown out by the, the impact that created it, cover a good part of the moon. And where that arrow roughly is for Mare, you know, you can see a, a ray from Tycho all the way up there and even crosses the Apollo 17 site, what we'll look at in a little while. But we've noticed that not all craters have rays. And the process that I study called space weathering is re responsible for moving, removing um, these rays over the time period of billions of years. So, you know, it, it won't disappear anytime soon, but over, you know, maybe the next 500 million to 800 million years, Tycho will finally lose its ray and it'll just blend in with the background. And the space weathering process is micrometeorites, little dust-sized particles, uh, that hit the surface um, for, for Earth. Those are the dust-sized particles that make our Lyriad le uh, meteor shower, which is happening this week. So if you, after this talk, go out in the dark and can find a nice space, you can see some uh, meteors entering uh, our atmosphere. And then the solar wind also changes these nice, fresh, rocky materials into glass, and that changes them from being bright to, to dark. So um, you probably have all heard the Apollo 50th anniversary when it was Apollo 11 uh, 50th anniversary back in August and um, 2019. But the Apollo 50th anniversaries are, are still coming. Um, Apollo 14 landed in January 1971. So they just passed their 50th. And upcoming is Apollo 15. It landed on the moon in July. Uh, 1971 and uh, left the moon in actually August 1971. So we'll be celebrating its 50th anniversary then. And uh, the Apollo program, as well as you know the, the predecessor Gemini and even Mercury um, program, gave us a sense of Earth as a, a boat in the sea of space and led us to enacting more environmental change and even kicked off Earth Day. So I want to watch wish everyone tonight a uh, happy Earth Day, uh, happy 51st Earth Day. So save your Earth because you can't get off. And the moon is a special place because it's really a time capsule. Um, there's no erosion, there's no you know, rain. Uh, it does have meteors or impacts, um, but there's no plate tectonics. So, its surface has been exposed to space for billions of years. Um, to kind of give you a context, you know, this is Buzz Aldrin's footprint on the moon, and it will probably last between 10,000 and 100,000 years before it gets it erased. Um, impact craters uh, on the moon have been there for, for billions of years, and the moon allows us, because we can 
count those craters and the rocks that the Apollo astronauts brought back, we can uh, date the age of those rocks. We can get an understanding of the flux of impacts hitting the moon and therefore Earth and also Mercury and Venus and asteroids and Mars. So by understanding the moon as an age reference, we can actually determine the ages of the other solid services across the solar system. And a graphic way to put um, the age difference between the Earth and the moon is if we look on the Earth side there, we have you know, a pie chart and time zero is at uh, or 4.5 billion years is at uh, the 12 o'clock position. As you rotate around in the uh, clockwise position, uh, age or time increases to current day. And at the center of that wedge in here, you can see you know, the oldest rocks on the earth are really, you, know, you, you have a few that are three to maybe almost 4 billion years old, but those are you know, a very, very small percentage. You might not even be able to see it on this diagram. Then we have some that are two and a half billion years old. And these are the oldest parts of our uh, crust, uh, you know, the parts where we live. So there's these cratons um, that are extremely old and record a, a pretty good bit of Earth's history. And then we move up to the, you know, most of our crust is you know, 600 million years or so. And that you know, represents in this case about 20, 25% um, of the crust was laid down in this time. But most of our crust, the ocean basins, you know, over 60%, has been laid down in the last 200 million years. So we've lost all of this time to plate tectonics and erosion. In contrast, we have the moon over here where over you know, the first four and a half billion years, most of its crust, that bright highlands uh, terrat material, is the oldest part of the surface of the moon. So it record what was happening at that point. And then the Mari, which are a little bit younger and uh, are less than 20% of the surface area, record what happened from about 4 billion to 3 billion years old. So if we want to know what happened uh, in the early solar system, we need to go to the moon and collect the samples to help us understand you know, impact processes that were happening, what was happening uh, with the sun, uh, and how our solar system came together. And the Apollo program did a good job towards that. Um, you can see I've color coded the stars with the landing sites. So Apollo 11 landed in these volcanic Mari area. Um, Apollo 12, this red one, uh, again in a, a Mari or basaltic uh, location. Uh, Apollo 14, of course, there was no Apollo 13. It didn't land on the moon because of the um, explosion on board, but luckily safely got back. It was such an important landing site location. Uh, Apollo 14 landed where 13 would have, which is in this mixed area, which actually, oops, is impact from this large basin up top. Uh, Apollo 15 is up here in the, the magenta. 16 is a nice highland site. And then 17, again, is over by the white star. And again, you can see these rays from Tycho prominently you know, crossing nearby the Apollo 17 site. And these samples really help us uh, understand the inner, inner solar system and, and uh, because it, under, it, it shows us the impact processes that were happening and how material uh, from the early solar system got redistributed to the inner solar system. So some of the major ideas, oh, sorry, next, that's the next slide. Um, so when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, they brought with them um, a seismometer on many flights. This is Apollo 11. Uh, Buzz Aldrin's putting out this seismic package to measure earthquakes or moonquakes. And that gives us an indication of what the moon is made of inside. And it is not green cheese, it's just more rocks. Uh, Apollo 15, they actually collected a sample of the Highlands um, rock or Highlands crust, and it's termed the, the Genesis rock. And they were, scientists were able to age date this. Uh, and know how old the early crust is. It's about 4.3 billion years old. Apollo 7 uh, had a lot of excitement because they saw this rusty orange colored rock and thought actually there might be volatiles moving around through the surface, but it was a fire fountain volcanic eruption that sent uh, log lava into the you know, air, although it's space, so there's no air, 
um, in, in really tiny bits. And the composition of that material it is red, so it didn't get rusted by that. Um, but it showed us that there was fire fountain volcanism like you find in Hawaii, where you've seen pictures of volcanoes erupting and throwing lava high up into the air. You know, that's what happened at Apollo 17. And the different emissions, um, you can't see Apollo 11 maybe on this, but they had to walk on Apollo 11 and 12. 14 had a little rickshaw pull behind, but Apollos 15, 16, and 7 all had the lunar rover, so they could drive many kilometers away and collect samples. And then each mission, each uh, mission got more samples than the next. And in Houston, they have over 800 pounds of lunar rocks and soils that we study, some of which we study here at WashU between the physics department and the Earth and Planetary Science Department. Other instruments that the Apollo astronauts deployed, this is Apollo 15 at the bottom. You can see the three prong thing in the kind of left hand side of the image, in the, in the, kind of the back. That's a magnetometer to measure uh, magnetic field of the moon. In the foreground, kind of right below the astronaut, is a little instrument to measure the solar wind. Um, the sun actually puts off a stream of uh, protons and helium particles, and it was there to measure that. The astronaut there is Dave Scott, and he's digging holes or actually drilling holes for a heat flow probe. So um, that was to measure the heat actually leaving the inside of the moon and, and um, allowing us to understand the heat budget of the moon so we would know how uh, hot it was and what elements uh, were contained in the moon. And all of these instruments, you can see their thin cables feed back to this instrument in the lower left hand corner. Um, which actually beamed the data back to the Earth for many years after the Apollo astronauts left. So we have a couple of years of, of record of all these measurements. And it really gave us an indication of some of our very early questions like where did the moon come from? What's it made out of? Is there geologic activity? So our post-Apollo answers, some of the things we were able to understand by these samples and geophysical data that came back is that the moon likely formed from a Mars size impact that hit Earth very early in the solar system. And that impact was assigned kind of oblique as the uh, image in the top right shows. And it knocked the material off uh, of Earth and it collected or coalesced around Earth um, over some period and then formed the moon. But we're still working out the details on this. How fast um, did the material come together to form the moon? Was there more than one theat-like impact that knocked material off Earth? Um, and were there other impacts? You know, did it come together as small particles? Did it come together as, as big lumps? We're still working out a lot of those details. Um, it was debated hotly whether the moon ever was geologically active before Apollo. And if it was, for how long? And through the samples that um, the astronauts brought back, like this is Apollo 16, Charlie Duke, who's the lunar module pilot, um, was collecting some soil samples here, uh, rocks out of the soil. And he's near this big boulder, which they also collected samples of. Those type of samples allowed us to, because of the geologic context, uh, know that the moon actually had a period where it was all incandescent uh, magma or lava very early in its history. And it, it floated a, a crust that was plagioclase rich or high in aluminum, very low in iron in the earliest ages of time. And then after a while, once that um, crust solidified and became hard, volcanic activity actually uh, started to happen. And because the volcanic material actually represents the deep mantle, its composition is just the opposite. It's very high in iron and very low in aluminum. So that's why when you look at the, the moon, you see those two different albedo features, the, the high albedo of the highlands and the low albedo of, of the mare. But what's still debated there, you know, that crown candy of it's sometimes messy is when did geologic activity stop? And has it even stopped? We don't know that for certain. There looks to be still some kind of tectonic activity. The moon might still be shrinking as it's cooling. And it still might even be outgassing um, in different volcanic regions. So we don't think there's any lava flows happening, but there still might be some interesting outgassing. And another big thing uh, Apollo taught us was the impact history of the Earth-Moon system. And 
really the entire inner solar system. Impacts were definitely a challenge for early life. Um, they may have destroyed uh, life before, you know, we have record of it uh, around two or three billion years. And we definitely know the dinosaurs had a bad day when uh, Chicxulub happened. But the interesting thing is these asteroids and, and comets might have also been the seeds for life. Um, depending on the model, Earth formed in a very dry, potentially organic, poor part of the solar nebula. And these ingredients of life that we need might have been brought here um, from outside you know, Jupiter's orbit. And it's you know, very interesting that you know, we need the moon to understand that record. And it's also brought this idea of what we call a late heavy bombardment. So on the right-hand side is a diagram. We have impact rates. So high up on the y-axis is a lot of impacts. Down in the lower left is very few to no impacts. And then ages, and we're just covering the first 2 billion years of uh, history in the solar system from 4.5 billion years to 2.5 billion years. And it was always thought, you know, when this, the solar nebula formed, there would have been a lot of rocks and debris flying around still. And until all the planets could have cleared their orbit so they could become planets by a new definition, you know, there would have been a slow decay of impacts, that dotted line. But in studying the moon sam samples, some scientists um, looking at the data see a potential spike. So something must have happened in our solar system sh to shake things up, to create this spike of impacts. And what we think might have happened is potentially Jupiter and Saturn uh, change their orbits um, through a resonance, or the outer um, solar system planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all migrated out away from our sun. And in doing that, actually through, if you look on the right diagram, you'll see the orbit of um, Mars in red and the orbit of Jupiter in yellow. And between that is the asteroid belt. And then out beyond that, um, we have the orbit of Neptune and all these trans-Neptunian uh, objects. And it's possible as the gas planets started to move about, they actually threw material both in and out of the solar system. And that could have been a, a potential source for Earth's water. Uh, and later uh, also I'll talk about you know, some of the moon water that, that we see. And this also combines with what we see when we look at exoplanet systems. So planet systems outside of our own solar system, it's the one side of galaxy. So sometimes you have these really, what we want consider weird configurations of Jupiter-like planets at Mercury type or orbits. So it shows that you know, our solar system is actually pretty unique in its, its place. So this is um, the Apollo 17 site. That mountain labeled South Massif is um, about a mile and a half high. Uh, down here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but there's a, a little bright albedo kind of in the lower right next to some of those impact craters. That's where Apollo 17 landed. The floor of this valley, which is called Taurus Latro Valley, is Mare Basalt. So it's you know that darker, higher iron material. I don't think there's any today, but and it wasn't really when I was a, a landslide happened off of South Massif. And we think that was actually triggered by the Tycho crater that um, ejected hit up at the top here and material slid down the face and then across the Mare. That's why you get this bright contrast between the highlands material and the Mare material. And at the station three, <clears throat> um, Jack Schmidt and James Cernan actually collected a little core sample. And this is part of the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis or ANGSA. So for the 50, well, 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, there were some samples that were actually kept uh, pristine uh, and they were specially curated by Johnson Space Center. And they knew that, you know, in time, techniques would improve and analysis would get better. So that's why they kept some samples um, from being distributed. They wanted to keep them uh, pristine as possible. And now for the 50th anniversary, you know, they've decided for Apollo 11, 
they decided to open up that, that core sample. So this is um, Jack Schmidt here with the, the rake at image B. This is the, the little, little lunar rover. And then this is the drill core sample that uh, some of the sample which we're actually studying at, at, at WashU. And this is what it looks like when it's you know, pulled out or before it gets put in. It actually gets hammered in by the astronaut. I'm gonna try and show with this video. So this is taken, uh, Jack Schmidt has the camera. Let's see. And we're in the Valley of Latreau. We're looking at Gene Cernan whacking that core into place. So he had to drive that into place. So now you're going to see Gene Cernan just pull that baby right out of the ground. You can hear him really working. And Gene's going to come over and show the core to the camera. So that's the sample that um, would, got broken into two parts um, and see one, the lower part got sealed on the surface of the moon and has been curated. The upper part has recently been open and samples are being sent here to Wash U and different scientists here are looking at, at the, the samples through their own you know, lens of, of science. Um, I'm looking at different material to see how it has been altered due to the micrometeorite impacts and the, the solar wind bombardment, so the solar wind. Um, we have a, a group looking at the noble gases, so like neon, argon, krypton, xenon, to determine uh, their sources, whether they came from the solar wind uh, or whether they're actually uh, from the moon and maybe it escaped through different geologic processes. Now we also look at the, the core chemistry to understand the geology of the Apollo 17. You know, we saw that bright landslide. This uh, actually core is the very upper part of it. But, you know, one of the things chemistry can tell us is, you know, was this a one-time landslide event or were there multiple events that uh, were triggered, triggered along the, uh, the South Massif? Uh, and also studying the chemistry goes along with that, looking at the mineralogy and petrology of the different rock types that make up the, the Taurus Latro Valley and also that highlands, you know, that cross that massif or mountain uh, on the south there. We can also do computer, or sorry, x-ray computed tomography. So when you go to the doctor, if you have an x-ray, that's a two-dimensional you know, image. We can actually collect x-rays and get a three-dimensional image of rocks. And from that, we can understand their composition and we can do that while they're actually still in the core and that core helps us understand the stratigraphy or the layering uh, that has gone on in the Torres Latro Valley. And then the last thing um, we're studying is the, the volatile isotopes of uh, potassium, uh, copper, and, and zinc to understand, again, the geochemistry of the moon and how geologic processes might uh, redistribute those elements uh, so we can understand 
the, the new data detail. And there's even a Wash U graduate, uh, Ryan Ziegler down here at the bottom. He's actually uh, the head curator of the lunar samples at, at Johnson Space Center. So some ideas uh, in science come before their time. And like Elka Dregner, who came up with the idea of continental drift by just looking at the continents and noticed they made puzzles, but people thought he was crazy. You know, in 1912, there was no way you were going to move continents through uh, crust and, and, and move them around the globe. So it wasn't until the 40s when we started getting data that we could under, actually understand continental drift. And like that, you know, there was this idea that the polar regions of the moon uh, thought about in the 50s and 60s and even 70s, that you might get ice at the poles of the moon. Um, and if volatiles like water and other gases uh, make it to the moon, if they bounce around and find areas that are very cold or in shadow, um, they could actually get trapped for periods of time and potentially even geologically long period of time. But when the Apollo samples came back, they were all dry, um, at least by our measurements. So it became the view that the moon was just you know, bone dry. But in the late 90s and uh, early 2000s and, uh, and ongoing, we started to understand that the moon does have water at its poles. So here we are looking at the North Pole of the moon in the foreground. And you can see that the sun's light, uh, because its rotation axis is perpendicular to the sunlight, any hill uh, or crater can actually make a, a shadow on the other side. So these shadowed areas are extremely cold. They can be as cold as a, you know, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit or about 100 degrees uh, Kelvin. So when molecules of, of water or other gases uh, get get trapped there, find their way into these cold areas. They just have no energy to leave for geologically long period of times. And on the right is a neutron spectrometer image um, where they can actually count the, the flux of neutrons coming back off the moon. And where there's water, there's you know, a low abundance of neutrons coming back. So well, where there's hydrogen, um, so we can actually map where there's hydrogen and then other spacecraft that help us understand that that hydrogen is, is water. So here, uh, that big red bullseye is, now we're looking at the south pole of the moon. The red are warmer temperatures like 300 degrees uh, Kelvin or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And the cold colors, the purples and the blue are in the you know, 50 degrees Kelvin or almost 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And in about 2009, there was a, impact that created by a, a two-part spacecraft, which you can see on the right there, called LCROSS, so the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. And where it impacted near the South Pole, they observed water and hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, SO2, and even uh, ethyls, the C2H4. So there are a lot of volatiles going on uh, in those very dark, cold regions of the moon, which begs the question, how did it get there? And one way to figure that out is to, of course, go back to the moon uh, with the Artemis program. So Artemis is NASA's plan to go onto the moon and even go on to Mars after that. It's our way of learning to, to live off the earth for long periods of time and also do it by creating the things we need on the moon to be able to sustainably stay there. So there's a couple parts to Artemis. There's uh, the rocket that has to get created, the SLS or Space Launch System on the left, which is heritage from um, the shuttle. There's what we call CLPS or the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. So NASA will contract with commercial companies to bring science packages to the moon. Eventually there will be um, the gateway and that's like an international space station, but orbiting the moon. So it'll be used, um, spacecraft coming up from the earth will probably dock there first and then go down to the moon and then the moon back up to it. So it saves it so it can use a very small, a very uh, small spacecraft that's very energy efficient. Um, the building of Orion, the capsule that can bring two to six astronauts to the moon or any place in the solar system. And then the hope of uh, tw in 2024, or probably slightly later, bringing the first woman and the next man to the moon with Artemis 3. 
and from that, actually building an Artemis-based camp for a long-term stay. So right now, NASA has the first three parts plan. Uh, Artemis 1, which we hope will happen at the end of this year, maybe early 2022. Um, it'll be uncrewed. It'll just be the first integrated flight to go out uh, around beyond the moon and then back. And it'll actually deploy 13 CubeSats, which are small satellites about a foot um, on each side. And some of these will return data of the moon. Others will go out into the solar system. And it, some of these are also built by, by university and even high school students have, have built these uh, little satellites. Artemis 2 will be next. It'll be crewed with four astronauts. It will orbit the moon in a very elliptical orbit um, and be a 10-day mission. It'll be kind of a full-up test of Artemis at the moon. And then Artemis 3, we hope, will be in 2024, probably be a, maybe 2025. Um, and it'll be the first crewed landing uh, since Apollo to land on the moon. And so far, you know, things are going pretty well. Um, these are all the check boxes NASA has to do just to get through to Artemis 1. And they're definitely in the home stretch out of the 49 um, you know, boxes that check off. They're in the, just the last five to go. You may have heard um, you know, to get down to the moon, NASA's actually having commercial providers do that. They had a competition where they selected um, three, the Blue Origin, Dynanix, and SpaceX to uh, look at a, a preliminary design to build a, a lander to go down. And then just last week, NASA chose SpaceX to build the rocket that will bring the um, next crew uh, to the moon. Uh, the CLIPS program, so this is really neat. This is, again, it's kind of like FedEx um, for science. Starting at the end of this year in, in 2021, uh, on the upper uh, left there, uh, missions will start being uh, landing on the moon with commercial providers uh, landing the rocket with NASA instruments. And every two year, or sorry, every year there'll be actually two uh, um, instruments being uh, two landers landing on the moon for the 21 to 2024 20, area. So it, it will be exciting. We'll have this uh, ramp up to Artemis 1, 2, and 3 through these CLIPS missions. And figuring out where that water may have come from was part of that grant uh, that Rose mentioned, a part of the ICE 5 which I wrote the grant in Hawaii, so it made a little bit more sense there. It's a nod to the 50th state and the television program. So it's the Interdisciplinary Consortium for Evaluating Volatile Origins. And it's um, co-eyes from across the US and, and Canada. We're working to try and find where the source of that water is by measuring its, its chemistry. So there are actually you know, multiple sources that could have delivered volatiles to the moon. Um, things like comets, which of course have water. There are a number of asteroid types that have up to 15 or so weight percent water in them. Um, IDPs are interplanetary dust particles. So those are actually shed off comets. Uh, and those are, you know, have hydrous minerals in them. So that's a source of water. Uh, the solar wind. So I mentioned how the, the sun actually streams out hydrogen or protons. You know, that can combine with oxygen and minerals to make water because that's just H2O. Um, and then also, you know, vol the volcanoes here on Earth um, belch out, you know, water and CO2 and SO2. So it's quite likely that the lunar volatiles or lunar volcanoes could have also uh, expressed the, their volatiles. And that's what we're seeing at the South Pole. And then there's some, you know, more, a uh, couple sigma possibilities like uh, the molecular cloud clouds, which are hydrogen rich, uh, may have actually deposited material there. So with survey, we have these four themes and what we want to understand through uh, experiments like I do at WashU, and I'll show a picture of that in a second is, you know, how the space exposure might actually cause uh, loss of water or actually could store water. The image here with the, the blue arrows shows how hydrogen, or sorry, water, once it gets on the moon, it can bounce around for a little bit. So we wanna understand uh, how long it takes uh, and whether there's some difference between rates, whether hydrogen 
uh, or sorry, water with two hydrogen versus water with a hydrogen and a deuterium. Deuterium is just um, a proton and a neutron. Whether you know those fractionate so that um, it actually changes the chemistry as the, the water molecules bounce around. So we're doing experiments and modeling to understand that. And we're measuring our experimental materials and then those planetary um, dust particles to use those as many uh, moons until we're able to get there to try and test some of our uh, instruments for measuring those D to H, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio, so that we can see, you know, each of these sources has their own D to H ratio. So we want to see whether we can actually differentiate um, those isotope, isotopic signatures. We want to use remote sensing to uh, detect and quantify any organics are there um, because organics are very important. With carbon, you can uh, make a lot you know, different and useful things for a sustainable living. Uh, and we also want to prove the ability to measure water on the lunar surface. There is some um, kind of big error bars on, on the measurements right now when we measure water with uh, reflectance spectro spectroscopy. So we want to narrow some of those um, uncertainties down. And when we finally do get to the moon with, with Artemis uh, or Clips, we want to sample those volatile rich regions on the moon and, and bring those materials back. We want to bring them back safely. We want to bring them back without any alteration happening in the process of either handling it on the moon, or bringing it back to Earth. And we definitely don't um, want any astronauts harmed because uh, these containers, if they do have like uh, hydrogen sulfide or ammonia, you know, it could be toxic to astronauts traveling back or to people working on the samples. So one of the things, um, oh, why, why water is so important is it costs roughly about $100,000 per kilogram to put material into low Earth orbit, so up at the space station. And water is used for many aspects of astronaut life, whether it's drinking or cooling equipment, um, power, radiation shielding, or plant growth. So if you have a source for water that's uh, off Earth, it, it lowers your launch costs and makes you know, going out into space uh, a lot easier if it's cost effective. And water is great because you can break it down to hydrogen, oxygen, its elemental particles, and you can use that to build rocket fuel. And now the moon becomes a fueling station, or you can even use it for oxygen sort of for breathing, or you can recombine them and, and get energy. So that's why we want to um, follow the water. And in my lab at WashU, I'm replicating those dust particles that you know, when they hit our atmosphere, uh, like the layered meteor shower, uh, they, they burn up and flash in a second. And those are just dust particles with a lot of light. Uh, and I can do that with a, a very high powered laser that focuses it down. On the left image, you see a, a silvery sample chamber that in there I keep uh, little powders of either lunar simulant or meteorites or even sometimes uh, actual moon dust. And we focus the laser in on that and on the very right you can see you know that light, uh, those photons hit the sample and release energy uh, and part of that is you know, energy of light. And it actually changes the sample from being you know, a lot of minerals and crystals into a more glassy amorphous, and we can then study its chemistry. So in conclusion, um, I wanna go back to the first slide to show that science is really a nested endeavor. You know, when we first know nothing and working from ignorance, which actually we're always working from, our questions are very basic and kind of primitive. But as we start to, to get uh, data like we have for Apollo, our questions get more and more complex. So you never you know, finish asking questions. You're just able to ask more complex questions. And from Apollo, we were able to understand how the moon formed. We understand its general geology and that impacts are important, but we need more detail, more rocks, more geophysical measurements to understand the deeper um, story of the moon. And that's you know, what Artemis will bring. It can help us an answer whether that spike at between four and 3.8 billion years ago uh, of impacts happened. It can help us answer where did the water come from? 
Um, it can also help us understand details about the giant impact that still need to be tested, that giant impact that, that formed in the moon. And you know, this idea that the moon uh, had, was once a magma ocean or completely molten, um, you know, how molten was it? How long did it take to cool? You know, where did it cool first? Uh, those details we don't know. And then, you know, how is the soil in the polar regions different than the regions where Apollo landed, which is more equatorial, which, you know, reach very warm temperatures during the day and, and not so cold temperatures at, at, at night versus the polar regions, which are extremely cold. So those are the things that last goal is what, you know, I study in the lab and study as part of uh, the survey program. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Um, and don't forget, you know, you go out at least see the just past first quarter moon tonight, or you can even go out and see some layered meteors. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gillis Davis. That was a wonderful talk. We have a few questions uh, in the chat, so we've got a few minutes, and I'll start with uh, a couple of those. Um, let's see. So the first question is, how much range did the LRV have? Could the astronauts theoretically travel to other landing sites? They didn't have that kind of range, and NASA always had um, a rule that they could drive no farther than they had oxygen in their, breathable oxygen in their backpacks to walk back. Um, so they drove up a distance of 35 kilometers. If they were to drive until the battery was dead, I think they could have doubled it to, to maybe 70 kilometers. Um, so, you know, nowhere near going to another site, but that is, you know, really what the next um, generation is, is actually making pressurized rovers. You know, the astronauts were exposed and had to be in pressurized suit for Apollo, but um, the next round, they'll actually, you know, be sitting in a, a you know, kind of a tractor trailer thing that's pressurized so they can actually have a bit of a normal life. The thing can drive automatically so it can go very long distances and they can go out and do geology you know, when they get to the location. Otherwise, it's kind of just living in a, a, a movable lunar base. Uh, we have someone who's asking, what spacecraft took that photo? The last photo, that was from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was launched in 2009 and is still orbiting the moon. Uh, would it be possible to jump from platform to platform? Would it be possible to get out of the moon's gravity? By jumping, no. The escape velocity for the moon is something on the order of uh, three and a half kilometers per second. So compared to Earth, where it's over 11 kilometers per second, it's a lot easier. So there's a, uh, less energy um, to, to leave the moon. So that's why using the moon as a, a gas station is, is definitely beneficial. Uh, it doesn't take uh, nearly as much energy to leave it to go to Mars or asteroids versus trying to leave Earth and going to the Mars or asteroids. We have a fun fact. Artemis is the goddess of the moon and the twin sister of Apollo. Yes, forgot to mention that. Um, will the Artemis program be affected by the new administration? Well, the, the new administration has a lot on their hands. Um, so in their priorities, going back to the moon isn't the thing they're doing right now, but um, Biden has chosen uh, Bill Nelson, who's you know an ex-astronaut, ex-senator, um, so he's chosen a person that you know he believes will you know continue the mission of, of Bridenstine, the former NASA administrator. So I think we are going back, but it, it will be delayed maybe by a year or maybe two. But it's not so as far as far as I can see, Biden isn't showing a, a lack of support for going back to the moon. How do the new Artemis EVA suits compare to the Apollo and International Space Station ones? So the new suits that they're coming up with um, are a lot more flexible and usable in the joints, especially in, in the fingers. That was, you know, um, 
one problem astronauts had and something they were always developing is that when you pressurize the suits, the fingers go straight out and you have to work against that to um, grab anything. And it's very tiring and strenuous on your fingers. Uh, astronauts came back with their, their fingernails all dismantled. It was, it was pretty bad. So um, more rigid areas where it can be rigid and more flexible where it can be flexible um, will, will is, is you know, the new um, spacesuit motto. Um, and also potentially wearing um, kind of coveralls over the suit because dust is a, a huge problem and not having to track in the dust into habitats, but also keeping the dust off movable parts so that they don't fail. So that will be another big change. Why do humans need to be sent to the moon instead of unmanned rovers? Um, it doesn't have to be an either or, like the, the clips is a good, you know, indication of that where you might send robotic spacecraft first to do some of the preliminary science uh, and investigation, but humans are just fundamentally better and take a lot less time to, in the field, understand the geology, understand what's um, surrounding them, and be able to you know, be mobile and collect samples. Uh, that chart that I showed with the Apollo uh, 16, 15, 16, and 17 driving, you know, 30 kilometers, you know, the Mars rovers, it took years to even approach that. Some of them never even got that far. Um, so having humans on board, it, it costs, you know, 10 or maybe 100 times more, but you get 100 times more science back. Uh, so it, it's, it's always great to have um, humans in the loop because they can also troubleshoot. When troubles happen with rovers, sometimes you're just stuck. Um, I, that looks like that's the last question. Does anybody else have any other questions? We have time maybe for one more quick question if anyone has one. Uh, if not, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. And we ask again uh, to let us know what you thought about tonight's event by filling out the survey, the survey, the online survey. The link to that is in the chat. Uh, that really helps us plan uh, for the future and lets us know what you thought about tonight's event. So, oh, let's see. That's a generic question. Are there any other events coming up? Yes, you can log on to our website at academyofsciencestl.org uh, to take a peek at some upcoming events. Uh, you can also sign up to receive e-news on our website, uh, and that'll let you know about uh, additional upcoming events as well. No other questions? OK. All right. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Gillis. It's a great presentation, and we really appreciate your time this evening. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, we did record, so uh, hopefully this will be up on our YouTube channel uh, within the next few days. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.